Oomph, someone like you isn't fit for such a big business deal. Leave it to me. After my first big opportunity was snatched away by Mike, I stood there dumbfounded. What's this? Clearly underprepared. How could you even think of negotiating with our company like this? Despite my sleepless nights preparing for this negotiation, it all seemed to be in vain. I bit my lip and gently touched the watch that was my father's keepsake. Hey, that watch is. The president, Mr. Smith's eyes widened. This became my turning point. My name is James. Raised by a single father, my mother had passed away when I was very young. But my father made up for her absence by showering me with love, so I never felt lonely or dissatisfied. I had only seen my mother in photographs, but my father always spoke of her as truly kind and loving. She died from an illness when I was just two years old. The woman in the photographs was strikingly beautiful, and my father always seemed a bit sad yet fond when he talked about her. My father was incredibly capable, never missing a school event and always cooking simple yet delicious meals every day. He was a man of few words but always watched over me and respected what I wanted to do. Father, I want to try this. At that, he would agree in a heartbeat and let me take on various activities. Swimming, baseball, piano, languages. I really got to try it all. Looking back, I realize how fortunate I was. We were neither wealthy nor poor, we lived a life without luxuries but also without wants, thanks to my father. While I was at school, he appeared to go to work, but he mainly worked from home to spare me the loneliness. Sitting next to him in the living room and doing my homework as he worked, I felt grown up. It was nothing more than imitating my working father, but it made me sit up straight, feeling like we were in it together. My father would smile and work while watching me. I loved these moments after dinner. James, never forget your manners. He would often say. Manners will definitely save you one day. Always be courteous, no matter whom you're dealing with. This was something he emphasized time and again, and indeed, he was always gentle and polite with everyone. His circle was always full of smiles, and people were eager to help him, and I received much help from those around us as well. My father was the coolest adult I knew, full of manly virtue, and I idolized him. Seeing me trying to emulate him, my father would blush and say, I'm not that great. But having my son look up to me is the ultimate reward as a father. Thanks for making me into a respectable father. Your mother in heaven must be looking at us with envy, he added. There was only one time my father hit me. In elementary school, a classmate mocked me for being from a single-parent home and insulted my father as well. Angered, I retaliated against the classmate. When my teacher told my father, he slapped me hard across the face. Tears brimming in his eyes. It was the first and last time I saw my father cry or hit me. Seeing me, Mrs. Miller hurriedly intervened, James loves you very much and just lost his temper because his friend made fun of you. I've already settled things with the other child's parents. Is that so? You were defending me. But listen, James, never do this again. Understand, my father firmly cautioned me. Then apologized deeply to Mrs. Miller and the other parents and silently led me away by the hand. I still remember that day. On the way home, my father gripped my hand painfully tight and said softly, James. I'm sorry. Not having your mother must have made things hard for you. I always saw my father as a towering figure, but on that day, he seemed a bit smaller. And I vowed never to retaliate against any injustices from then on. By adhering to my father's teachings and treating everyone with respect and courtesy, most injustices eventually disappeared. Indeed, by being courteous, my reputation among seniors and teachers improved, and things began to work in my favor. I started to understand why there were always smiles around my father and why everyone was willing to help us. James is such a hard worker and always tries his best, which makes us want to support him, my teachers and seniors would say. Helping me to have a pleasant life as a middle school student. During the summer break just as I was about to enter high school, my father passed away. It was a traffic accident on the way home. Despite having seen him off as usual that morning, I didn't know what to do when my father returned home in such a changed state. Suddenly, I felt as if I was left alone in the world. Everything before me went dark. The only thing left in my hands was the watch my father always wore with care. James, this is a one-of-a-kind watch given to me by a comrade-in-arms, he had said. 
He always looked at it with a smile and promised to give it to me when I became an adult. Dad, when I become an adult, I'll wear this watch with care, I had promised. It was routine to carefully wipe it down before going to school every day. During my three years in high school, I managed to get by with various part-time jobs. Everyone at my part-time jobs was kind, and I lived each day desperately with the help of those around me. I immersed myself in work to drown out my sorrow. If I kept busy with studies and work, I could forget the sad things. Convinced of this, I made sure not to take any days off. James, don't push yourself too hard. Emily, who had known me since childhood and lived next door, would say worriedly as she sometimes brought over homemade dishes. Emily, thank you. I'm fine. I enjoy both my job and my studies, I would reply. Is that so? Emily would look at me worriedly. To her eyes, I probably looked pitiful. Back then, I was putting on a brave face, but in reality, I was still dragging along the sadness of losing my father. It would be a lie to say I wasn't envious of my friends who played with friends or were devoted to sports. But I was desperate to live, and until I could be proud in front of my father. I vowed to the watch that I wouldn't complain and kept pushing myself in both my studies and jobs. I realized that attending college was out of the question, so I wanted to study as much as possible here. My father, who had only graduated high school, sometimes expressed a slight regret about not attending college. James, do you like studying? Um, not particularly, but learning new things is fun. Young me answered, and my father, smiling, continued. When you become an adult, you might not be able to study even if you want to. I regret not studying a bit more seriously when I was a student. That was a bit difficult for me as an elementary school student to understand, but now that my father was gone, going to college seemed difficult. Now in high school, this might be my last chance to really learn. James, are you planning to work after graduation? Mr. Thompson, my high school teacher, understanding my situation, started discussing job options with me early. A guy as serious and capable in studies as you could succeed in any college. It's a pity. Despite saying this, he always helped me think about job opportunities. I was truly grateful. I cherished the kindness from those around me and lived each day to the fullest. Gradually, instead of dwelling on my grief, I became motivated to live in a way that wouldn't disgrace my father. The words I spoke to the picture of my father and mother became more and more forward-looking. With help from those around me, I landed a job at a company that seemed too good for a high school graduate. I must do well and not disgrace those who helped me get here. Dad, I'm taking the watch with me. On the first day at the company, I took the keepsake watch and wore it. From that day on, I worked desperately every day with my father's watch as my talisman. Hey, you, the high school grad. Handle this. My supervisor, Mike, would carelessly throw documents onto my desk which I carefully organized and reviewed. The work environment wasn't bad. Except for this supervisor. Everyone else instructed me politely, treating me as a full-fledged employee without favoritism despite my high school diploma. Although it was challenging at first, it was truly gratifying to be given real responsibilities and not be looked down upon as just a high school graduate. Only Mike never recognized me as a full-fledged employee, always assigning me menial tasks. It was just the beginning, I thought. For now, I must endure. I truly believed that someday Mike would recognize me. With that belief, I obeyed even Mike. Indeed, Mike always topped the sales charts and was deeply trusted by the front office. He was capable at his job, and I thought I could learn something from him, so I persisted without getting discouraged. Hey, high school grad. Why are you even in this company? Every day, like clockwork, Mike would hurl insults at me. Indeed, this company mostly employed college graduates, and the number of high school grads like myself could be counted on one hand. And one by one, unable to withstand Mike's bullying, they would leave. I could sometimes hear the office ladies whispering. Did you hear? Another high school kid quit. Yeah, it's Mike, right? He looks down on everyone because he's from a prestigious school. The last one who quit was a college grad too but not from a very prestigious one, and he really gave it to her. You're either elite or you don't belong here. Mike would say, currying favor with the bosses but being cruel to those he considered beneath him. James, it's amazing how you can stand him. I just can't handle it anymore. 
a college-educated co-worker said before quitting. Within less than six months, all my peers had quit, and I was the only one left. Ha, huh, tough little guy. At least you've got grit. Mike would snort disdainfully, continuing to assign me menial tasks and snide remarks, but as I endured and handled them, my reputation among others began to grow. James, want to try handling this task? I think you're ready for it now, someone suggested. James, want to come along on this deal? It'll be a great experience for you, another offered. Gradually, I was entrusted with bigger responsibilities and allowed to accompany on major negotiations. Getting direct exposure and learning opportunities. However, somehow I always ended up being replaced midway through these tasks. At first, I thought it was due to my own inadequacies and seriously reflected on what might have gone wrong. But as Mike frequently ended up taking over, I began to feel something was off. Surely not. The unpleasant thought crossed my mind, but there was no proof. It could just be a coincidence. Perhaps I truly was lacking, and Mike was just cleaning up after me. I shook my head, dismissing the troubling thoughts. Indeed, Mike was unpleasant. But blaming my shortcomings on others wouldn't help me grow. I continued to focus on self-improvement with a positive attitude. I motivated myself with the goal of someday handling an entire negotiation on my own from start to finish. James, this is a crucial deal for the company. Can I entrust it to you? One day, five years after I joined the company, President, Mr. Carter directly assigned me a significant negotiation. Yes. I'll do my utmost. This was certainly my turning point. I spared no effort in my preparations, working tirelessly to approach the negotiation well prepared. I communicated thoroughly with the sales representative, ensuring the materials were clear and comprehensive to avoid any oversights. Wow, James. You're doing even better than I taught you. As I prepared with guidance and advice from many, the day of the negotiation finally arrived. A kid like you handling such a big deal? You're in over your head. Step aside. Mike said, taking the materials I had prepared. Then he reported to Mr. Carter, I'm concerned about relying solely on him, so I'll accompany him. And it was decided that Mike would join the negotiation. This gave me an uneasy feeling. The unpleasant scenario that had once crossed my mind was about to become reality. On the day of the negotiation, Mike and I headed to the meeting in a taxi together. Despite the significance of what we were about to undertake, the ride was silent throughout. Hey, high school grad, I'll handle this. Just watch and learn. Mike said tersely before entering the conference room. Inside, the president, Mr. Smith, was waiting. As the negotiation progressed, Mike took charge of the conversation. However, he began deviating from the materials, and the discussion became disjointed, never quite coming together. The conversation veered off in directions I hadn't intended, and I didn't get a chance to speak at all. Seeing the increasingly grim expressions of the people from the client company, I clenched my jaw in frustration. It felt as though all my efforts had been wasted, leaving me feeling helpless. Driven by his panic at the disarray, Mike's discourse strayed further from the core issues. Amidst deep sighs and bored tapping on the table, Mike's verbose talking turned him into a virtual jester. Really, what is this? It seems this negotiation was a waste of time. Mr. Smith finally expressed his frustration. I'm terribly sorry. In the ensuing silence, I instinctively apologized. I thought the documents were well prepared and clear, what a pity. He sighed deeply, glancing my way momentarily. Mr. Smith looked at my watch and exclaimed, H.M. You? James, was it? Where is that watch from? Pointing to my watch with trembling hands, he asked. Yes, my name is James. This watch was a keepsake from my father. Could it be your father was David? Yes, my father was David. Did you know him? After a moment of thought, Mr. Smith looked intently into my face again, as if seeing it anew, and said, I see. Ah, James. You're David's son? I apologize if I'm mistaken, but did you prepare these documents? Yes, I replied. In that case, could you give the presentation from your perspective once more? While somewhat bewildered, I remembered the story of my father's watch, a unique treasure given by a comrade. I was shaken. 
but I had been given another chance. Mike sat next to me, his face ashen. Taking a deep breath, I delivered the presentation as practiced. It went well, I believe. I engaged sincerely with the client who listened intently. The Q&A session was efficient and thorough. As I concluded the presentation filled with a sense of achievement, Mike clicked his tongue softly, looking at me with displeasure. Mr. Smith approached with applause, extending his hand for a handshake. Well done, you put together a solid presentation. Thank you very much. I shook hands with Mr. Smith, and we successfully sealed the deal. You seem to work much like your father did. He continued, sharing a bit about my father. It's hard to believe now, but my company once struggled financially. Your father, David, saved us during that crisis. He was truly my right-hand man, tirelessly dedicated to the company. Even after he started his own business, we remained good friends and business partners. He even had this unique watch made especially. My father always cherished this watch, saying it was a unique treasure given by a comrade, I explained. Is that so? David said that. Mr. Smith held back tears, we truly lost a great man. A brief silence enveloped us. Let's have dinner together sometime soon, he suggested, and with that, we left his company. Upon returning to our company, I learned that Mike had already reported to Mr. Carter. It's good I was there. I managed to secure the deal. It seems he is still not quite ready to handle such responsibilities alone. I will take over this project. I couldn't believe my ears. Mr. Carter also said, if that's the case, let's leave it to Mike. You really did well. The uneasy feeling I had experienced wasn't just my imagination. When my suspicions turned into certainty, Mike was smirking. You think I'd actually let someone like you take the credit? He whispered snidely as he passed by. Perhaps it was too soon for James. Mr. Carter said, looking disappointed. I could only stand there, dumbfounded. After finishing his report, a colleague rushed over. Hey! What's going on? Why is that project credited to Mike? All I could do was give a weak smile. That guy. My colleague muttered bitterly before walking away. It seemed I wasn't the only victim. Despite everything, Mike continued to go out on business deals, further enhancing his sales performance. I had come to understand his scheme. Mike, why do you go to such lengths? I confronted him. Ha! Huh? It's too much for a high school grad like you. I'm cleaning up after you, and you're acting all high and mighty? So, every time the project was handed over to you midway, was it all for that? Mike laughed through his nose without a hint of shame. What can a useless high school grad do? Just stick to the menial tasks. He waved his hand dismissively and walked away. Frustrated, I punched the wall. Why hadn't I noticed before? No, I had noticed, but I had chosen to ignore it. After that, no significant deals came my way. I grew increasingly disillusioned with the endless trivial tasks. Hey James, you've been called to the reception room. There's a visitor, you better hurry. One day, after being informed by a senior colleague, I rushed to the reception room. When I entered the reception room after knocking, there were Mr. Carter, Mr. Smith, and a pale-faced Mike. I apologize for keeping you waiting, Mr. Smith, it's been a while, I said. Mr. Smith, who had a somewhat angry expression, softened a bit when he saw me. James. It's been a while. I heard you've been ill, how are you feeling now? Ill? I wondered. No, as you can see, I'm quite well, I replied. Mr. Smith nodded and then glanced briefly at Mike. You know, I thought I had agreed to a deal based on your presentation. But after that, only this man Mike came to our company. Mike was trembling. When I asked him, he told me that you had been ill for a while, and the responsibility had been shifted to him, Mr. Smith continued. Mr. Carter frowned at the ashen-faced Mike, pressing him for an explanation. While Mike stuttered through his defense, Mr. Smith went on. If he is to continue to be in charge of the deal, I must say I cannot trust him and would like to consider this deal void. Mr. Carter apologized profusely and instructed his secretary to review all of Mike's projects. Mr. Smith, if you would permit me, could you possibly continue the deal with me as the responsible party? I asked boldly. 
Mr. Smith nodded approvingly. I am strict. I'm expecting a lot from your work, he said before leaving. Subsequently, an internal investigation brought all of Mike's credit stealing to light. As expected, other young employees had also been victims of Mike's credit stealing, and in some egregious cases. He hadn't even attended any meetings yet had altered documents to replace names with his own. Damn, why did that old fool have to meddle? And don't get too comfortable, you only got that deal through connections. Mike spat bitterly, his face flushed with anger, as he was relegated to a subsidiary on a remote island. Due to the small size of the island, the reason for his demotion had quickly spread, and he was evidently feeling very constricted. Well done, James. It really was right to have you in charge, said Mr. Smith, with whom I had multiple meetings and dinners, earning his full trust. After numerous meetings and dinners with Mr. Smith, I earned his complete trust. Our mutual efforts led to improved business performance and even new deals introduced by Mr. Smith. Thank you always. About that matter you introduced last time. Now, he was like a second father to me, and I often sought his advice over meals. After the incident, Mr. Carter apologized, saying, I was so blinded by my trust in Mike that I neglected other employees. How shameful. I am truly sorry. This led to a re-evaluation of all employees, making the workplace more conducive than ever. Along with that, while not as extreme as Mike, other senior employees who had been coasting on the efforts of juniors were sidelined, eventually leaving the company. The environment became more dynamic, with fair recognition of efforts, fostering healthy competition and improved performance. Consequently, I was promoted swiftly. It was gratifying to see that effort was fairly rewarded, and by closely coordinating with clients, the results multiplied. This cycle led to even more business opportunities. Lately, I've been able to assign more responsibilities to juniors and subordinates. It's a shame that James is stepping back, but his successor is a really great person. Recently, I've been hearing this more often and have found joy in personnel development. However, I remain to be in change of Mr. Smith's company. Thank you for taking your time despite your busy schedule. I shared a laugh with him, because you are my benefactor in origin, but perhaps I should pass it on for the sake of my juniors. Our dealings with Mr. Smith led me to discover more about my father, and it was after that deal that my work was re-evaluated. I couldn't bear to turn my back on Mr. Smith. By the way, James. With your skills, you could go independent, couldn't you? Have you not considered it? Mr. Smith inquired one day. Seemingly under the impression that, like my father, I might do the same. I haven't ruled it out, but. I admitted, but there was still a desire to contribute to the current company. Despite the challenges, this company had nurtured me from a high school graduate to where I was now. At least until the subordinates and training can stand on their own, I think I'll stay, I added. Mr. Smith smiled warmly. That's another way you resemble your father. He remarked, apparently reminiscing and seeing my father in me. There was one thing that particularly piqued my curiosity, prompting me to ask Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, have I become the kind of man like my father who you respected in?